I'm an organic farmer. I'm not afraid of change. I am the change. I am the change. So global perspective, um, how does organic farming have anything to do with this? Well, let's go to, who's got the slides back there? I've got some slides. This is the remote. Do I just push the button on this? I'm not as freestyle as she is. I kind of have these visual cues. This is the nice little rock that we live on, folks. And uh, it's in kind of a little bit of trouble here. Using data from the World Bank, is this or is that not a global perspective? Right there, okay. Uh, approximately 38% of the surface of this planet is in agri annual agriculture, okay? That means that once upon a time, this whole entire planet was a whole, healthy, three-dimensional perennial ecosystem. And human beings removed 38% of that in order to scratch up the ground to grow their seeds. That has real environmental ecological consequences, real social consequences, real economic consequences. Um, I think that's important. 60% of all human beings that live on this planet are farmers. Well, that's actually a pretty high number. Until we then look at it and see that, like, most of those farmers are subsistence farmers. They're growing on a, uh, such a small pieces of ground. In Haiti, they have approximately two-thirds of an acre per human being in that country. There are other places, you know, one acre, two acres, three acres at the most. Most people who are involved in farming are subsistence farmers, and they're barely getting by. They are not producing surpluses to share with others. That's not pretty either. And they're doing it in what used to be a fully intact three-dimensional perennial ecosystem. Well, in the United States, things are a little bit different. Not 38% of our, our uh, continent is in annual crops. It's more like 50%. A mere 200 years ago, uh, Caucasoids, of which I am one, came to this continent and destroyed a full, whole, healthy, intact ecosystem, releasing all of the carbon. Uh, there's actually ice cores in Greenland that have been done that show that uh, during the, the first phase of American settlement, like 1700s to mid-1800s, was one of the largest carbon releases ever. It was pre-industrial. Well, where was the carbon release? All these trees were cutting down, burning, turning into wood, plowing up the prairies, and so on, and so on, and so on. What's also different about the USA, a mere 1% of uh, people are involved in agriculture. Only 1% of the 313 million of us out there, so only 3 million farmers in the USA. What gets really even weirder, only 1% of that are organic farmers. So there's approximately 31,000 organic farmers in the USA. How many people here are organic farmers? Raise your hand. You know, it's an absolutely entire possibility that 10% of all Organic agricultural farmers are right here in this building this weekend, right? So we can use this data and get a little depressed. Oh, man, there's only 31,000 organic farmers. 10% of them are here in this room. One little cyanide or nuclear whatever, we're done. Um, we, we have a disproportionate amount of leverage to make real ecological change because those... those um, 30,000 organic farmers in the USA manage five and a half million acres. This is a liberation story. There were five and a half million acres of farmland that in the last 50 years have been the scene of uh, biological warfare and chemical warfare. And we have liberated that land from chemical warfare. Five and a half million acres. And in the years between um, when I got started with, with Organic Valley, the, the USA didn't even really have an organic standard at all. There was like a hodgepodge of different, you know, certifying agencies. Organic wasn't really agreed to as what we all, you know, you guys over in Dakota think it's one thing, Missouri thinks it's another thing, Ohio another thing. Um, the industry wasn't even an industry. There was like the poverty section at the produce store. We see these half rotten carrots. It's like, you know, who wants that anyways? You know, is, many of you guys remember that, you know? And now there's stores that are dedicated to organic foods. In the years between when I got started uh, doing organic farming and now, the uh, industry has grown from about a three billion industry nationwide to over $30 billion in sales. We created something out of nothing. 
We liberated five and a half million acres of uh, ground from poisonous assault, and we have created a, a billions and billions of dollars food industry. Organic farmers, we're a weird bunch. Uh, we're a weird, weird bunch. Of the, uh, of the 1% of American farmers, this is farmers are a weird bunch, okay? All of us are. <clears throat> um, out of all farmers in America, who can guess the, the uh, dominant language of all people in the USA in agriculture? Espanol. Number one language in farming in America. What's the number two language? Deutsch or German or some variant thereof. English is a pale third. Third language in, in agriculture in America. What's interesting, in, in agriculture, about 14% of all farmers, the primary farmer is female. Organic is radically different. 30% are female. So do a little twisted math. Congratulations, ladies. I'm going to congratulate you a little more. Because you think about it, <laughs> if, if we've got the majority languages is uh, Spanish and German, and 30% are female, that very well may mean that white Caucasoid males are in the minority, English speaking. Whoa! You know, who would have thunk that? We're a weird bunch. We have a, a tremendous amount of leverage. Our one little drop is more than a drop. Our little drop is a cosmic ripple in the big, huge trampoline. You bounce a little golf ball on it and the ripples just go out <laughs> like in the Lord of the Rings when Saruman fell. We've, we're changing the world <laughs> one organic acre at a time, one organic man, woman, child at a time, one Spanish speaking, Dutch speaking, English speaking person at a time. What's also interesting about farmers, uh, especially us organic farmers, Believe it or not, we're politically active. <clears throat> she gave us this call to arms, you know, call, or the, on the 2-4-D stuff, call in, join the petition, all that kind of stuff. That stuff drives me nuts. It doesn't do any good. It's the drop in the bucket, yada, yada, sign it all up. Well, that, that may very well be, but when the organic standards became federal law, the National Organic Program, it was the largest ever citizen response to anything that the government has ever done, period. Us, all right? We are, where's that slide? Politically active, all right? If you guys want to have a lot of fun, this is really bizarre. This country, we can still go down to Washington, D.C., make a couple of phone calls and walk around the halls. What we do when we do that, we are forcing the staff to sit down. It's not just a phone call or an email or fax or whatever. We're going down and we say, hi, my name's Mark Shepard, and I'm an organic farmer, and I'm going to tell you my agenda, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, X, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And they say, well, what are you asking for? I say, nothing. I want, I want you to know what we're doing, and you better keep up with us. Because we aren't afraid of change, we are the change. We are the change. So I recommend everybody, at least once, if not twice, a year, oh, excuse, or however often you can afford to do it, take your family on vacation to Washington, D.C. Make a call to Moses, make a call to your local co-op. I call Organic Valley, I call the Organic Farming Research uh, Foundation, and you say, what's the hot topics, what do I do? You go down to Washington, D.C. to the OFRF office, they give you talking papers, and you wander the hall with your kids, and they're like, whoa, you know, the White House, cool. Go on a family vacation and talk to those people. If you can't make it to Washington, D.C., go to your state house. The more time of theirs we spend telling our story, the more they'll have to listen. We don't necessarily have the big bucks, the political clout, and all that kind of stuff, but we will tell our story. They have to hear us. One of my favorite things to do is go up to my local politician, I won't name his name, look him in the eye and shake his hand and tell him my story and put him on the spot and make him lie to me. <laughs> because he knows he's lying, and I know he's lying, and I'm going to look him in the eye and say, how dare you? That's fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> We're farmers. <laughs> we, we think a lot of things are fun. That's kind of twisted. But <laughs> okay, so if um, I wrote this book, Restoration Agriculture, in part because a lot of people didn't quite understand what I was doing. I wasn't really doing ecological restoration because ecological restoration is, is part of this game that the 
people on the side of the wizard's side of the curtain, they want us to get into this discussion. It's either environment or it's economy, either this or that. You have to pick, you know, Democrat, Republican, you have to either or, either or. Well, you know, the whole cosmos is not either or. It's all a sloshing back and forth of all these different things. So restoration agriculture is a phrase coined to mean that we're going to farm in such a way that we accomplish ecological restoration simultaneous with producing food crops um, and with an emphasis on the staple food crops, carbohydrates, proteins, and oils. Everything from annual grains and legumes all the way up to chestnuts and hazelnuts and pine nuts and so on. Um, when we plant these systems, if we're imitating the natural systems of our place, we know that those natural systems have persisted for eons. This is really sustainable. Just think about the brush on the side of the road. They grubbed it out with Norwegian backchair farmers, they plowed it up with horses, they cut it off with hand saws, chainsaws, pushed it in a pile, burned it, run it off with a grinder on the side of the road, <laughs> grind it all up. Then they use herbicide on the thing, and what does it do? <laughs> Comes back. That's sustainable. That is sustainable <laughs> agriculture. That's what we want to imitate. And we can grow our own crops in the alleys in between. I'll talk about that later. Wherever we live, there are ecological regions that have plant families, plant communities that grow together naturally, natively, and we can derive our livelihood by farming the actual ecology of the planet instead of fighting against it all the time. Um, I had mentioned, of course, that 38% you know, of the world's surface is in uh, uh, annual agriculture. In the US, it's over 51% of the the, the whole surface of our continent is in annual agriculture. That means we plow it up in the spring or use herbicide in the spring. The soil is exposed to the sun, to the wind, to the rain. It blows away, it washes away. It goes to the Gulf of Mexico. All of the chemical contamination causes dead zones. We hear a lot about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. There's a dead zone off of every single uh, river, port city in the U.S. of A. There is, is one, just not as big as the Gulf of Mexico one. Well, not only is 51% in annual agriculture, all of the green, yellow, and red you see on this particular slide right here, that's agriculture. That includes pasture land, range land, and so on. This is an ecological crisis. We have destroyed this continent, and only 1% of the people are raising the food for so many other people out there. And what's really twisted, it seems weird, there really isn't a food shortage. <clears throat> There's actually plenty of food except that there's so much food here where we're growing it, we've got to do things like uh, feed it to animals because we've got to get rid of it. Because people who are in these third world countries who are starving to death, they can't access that food because they don't have any money. Food has become commoditized to the point that if you no longer have money, you can no longer participate in the food system. And so they starve while we figure out ways to get rid of the surplus. All we have to do, and this is, this is really fascinating, I find it really fascinating that um, I would be on stage with the daughter of the world's probably most famous vegetarian in the world. And both of us would talk a little bit about like agriculture and animals and livestock. Uh, this is also part of the either this or that crowd is we're getting played like puppets and we have to stop getting played this way. That, oh, it's the, it's the vegetarians versus the meat eaters. You know, that, that animals are the cause of all these problems. If we were to just stop eating beef, all this food could be used to feed people. That's true. If we just stop feeding 90% of the grains and legumes that we give to cattle, for example, we now have an additional, you know, nine out of 10 pounds of food available for human consumption. We have nine times as well, at least twice as much food available to us. Um, I just turn my page on myself, I take my notes. Well, here we are, we're organic farmers. How many of you uh, have converted from a former type of agriculture into organic farmers? How many were conversions? Okay. One of the things that you do at first, congratulations, right, exactly, on all of you guys. One of the things that we do at first is we want to manage our soil. We are, after all, organic farming. The word organic means it's a natural compound, naturally occurring compound, it's biodegradable. Organic comes from these carbon compounds. And what is carbon? It's from, originally from carbon dioxide. Photosynthesis happens. Carbon dioxide comes out of the air, turns into plant matter. The very first thing that most of you guys who are new conversions did, instead of using chemicals that oxidize your organic matter, you now start to build your organic matter. You start to use uh, crop rotation, cover crops, 
uh, green manure plow downs, composts, mulch, compost tea. You want to manage your water better. You uh, manage your decomposition cycle, biologicals. What happens when you take this carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil, you have done positive environmental good, one drop at a time. You are scrubbing the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. When you have carbon dioxide, think about carbon in our, our world economy. It's the energy source, it's fuel. It's the firewood in your wood stove, it's the hydrocarbons in our cars, it's the energy. It's the energy that drives the whole entire soil, soil food web. We're taking carbon dioxide out of the air, putting it into the soil, increasing the soil organic matter, and that is the fuel that fuels the soil food web. It's the soil food web that now releases the nutrients that we need to grow our crops even more healthily. So just the simple step, the first step you take of, of managing your soil organic matter uh, has a huge difference. The difference is so huge that uh, I wonder if I go to it next. Yeah, right there. I read this book and it's like twisted my head. It's like, what? Cows save the planet? No, I know it was a fact. Cows destroy the planet, yada, yada, yada. In here, um, they quoted some uh, uh, Canadian scientists who assembled the data and determined that with 38% of the world's um, surface in cropland, all that we have to do is raise our soil organic matter 1.3% and we take the atmosphere back to pre-industrial levels. No international laws, no quotas, no tax and trade, uh, you know, no major change other than how we manage our soil. We've taken that much carbon out of the atmosphere, put it back in the soil. So our power as organic farmers in control of five and a half million acres is huge, 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 huge. So cows save the planet, how can you do that? Go search for this up here, photos. J.R. Simplot, CAFO, Idaho. Pictures online there frequently get blocked and pulled down because there's these ag gag laws in place that says you can't take pictures of them. It's like, what do you mean you can't take pictures of them? Well, I've been to some of these places. Go back to that slide. I've been to some of these places. This one valley in Idaho, the base of the mountain slopes was packed with animals for 20 or 30 miles in a row, shoulder to shoulder, knee deep in their manure, factual places, go do this search online and look at some of your pictures yourself. I wanted to download some to make you sick, um, but that's the only one I could get. This is using cattle, which is a technology. Grazing animals, grazing and browsing animals are a technology that we can use either to destroy the planet or to rebuild the planet. Because I knew, let's go to the next slide, it didn't advance for me. Hello, there, whoop, 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 back, shh. There. I've been to Africa. Um, we've all seen pictures of the Middle East. Animals are being overgrazed on huge acreages. Uh, you, the cattle go in first and they graze their favorite stuff and they eat only their favorite stuff and their favorite stuff until it almost goes away. Then the rank stuff grows up and you can't really raise cattle anymore so you gotta bring in the sheep and the sheep eat their favorite stuff and it kinda almost goes away until all you're left with is goats like down on the lower right there nibbling on a couple of olive trees. It's about all that's left. Animals are being used in the industrial confinement uh, facilities for a huge profit for the people who are doing it. And it's creating massive amounts of pollution, unhealthy animals, unhealthy food, and they're consuming grains and they're not even designed slash evolved to eat grains, to eat grass and they nibble on trees. Animals are also being used and they're overgrazing and they're destroying ecosystems worldwide. Grazing animals, feeding animals, eating animals is the problem, right? Well, not really. We're organic farmers. We're not afraid of change. We are the change. We already took our lands out of poison uh, management, and we now start building our soil. We actually created healthier soil that takes carbon out of the atmosphere, holds more water, absorbs more toxins. We, t we actually built healthier soil by farming. We can actually save the planet with using animals. And I find it fascinating that a vegetarian, daughter's veg of, of a vegetarian and myself be talking about like animals and livestock on stage. It's, it's a weird world, isn't it? This particular picture right here, this is on our farm. This picture is taken right now. That picture is the middle of a cornfield 15 years ago. 
what we did at first, you manage your organic matter. Start building your soils, manage the property organically. We planted it to pasture. One of the first things that, that you can do if, if you're gonna manage a whole row crops farm, uh, managing your soil organic matter, you'll realize quickly the way to really get the carbon down there quick is, is put it to pasture, put it to grass and manage your, manage your grass. Let it grow, the roots grow down. Graze it off or mow it off, the roots die back. That's all that carbon stays in the soil. Well, trees also take a tremendous amount of carbon out of the atmosphere. These are black walnuts here, mulberry in the foreground. Um, if you're gonna plant black walnuts, take land out of production, just grow black walnuts. Well, now that farmland is no longer producing anything, except for walnuts that maybe in 70 years it'll turn into something. But walnuts, they'll want, you'll want to like prune those, trim the branches up so they have a nice saw log. You want to do some weed control underneath. You want to do some fertility management. So why not use cattle as the tool to drive ecological change? The cattle can help to keep the pasture healthier and greener, more vigorously growing. They can conveniently browse all the branches off down low. So they're doing the pruning for me, reducing my work. I now get a two-story agriculture with a nut crop up top, a timber crop in the middle, and then the cattle down below. This particular practice is called silvopasture. It's one of the agroforestry practices that, believe it or not, is a USDA-funded agricultural system. Um, and what, what research has been done, look up the National Agroforestry Center Association for Tag uh, Temperate Agroforestry. Uh, what the University of Missouri Columbia has discovered in agroforestry systems, farmers adopting agroforestry systems are showing no net loss of productivity. They're showing increased productivity. Well, it's because we're going into third dimension. We're not just growing grass anymore or soybeans or corn. We're now growing trees and soybeans, trees and grass. Let's go to the next slide. Will that move on me? It's fun how you guys keep goofing, goofing with me. Now, what do you think looked happier? These animals here, and Taya, the guard dog here, doing her happy little thing, do these look like happier animals than the ones in the, the uh, confinement feedlot? I think so. Um, <laughs> does anybody here, but I'm not gonna ask that question, I was gonna say, does anybody not believe that animals actually have feelings and emotions? If you don't believe that they have feelings and emotions, you haven't talked to a goat. You, you wake up in the morning, man, it's like, oh, <laughs> bad day for the goat, huh? Okay. <laughs> bad day for the goat's a bad day for me. <laughs> so let's go back to this picture here. I, I, I believe that animals have feelings. This, this gal down on the right, the jersey, scratching her chin on the tree. This is Anna, and what a sweetheart. She'll just come up to you and put her head in your arms and wants to be cuddled and snuggled. I think that... Uh, love that these animals feel, the healthy, happy lifestyle that they have, affects the quality of their food products, whether it's meat or eggs or milk or whatever. And if you want to think about the inner state, the internal state of our animals, if you think about the last time you drove down the road and you saw the police car lights go off in your rearview mirror, what happened to you? Oh, just. So what if you lived... What if you lived your whole entire life feeling that cruddy inside? That is an actual, factual, measurable, chemical change that happened in your body, and every one of you who are driving has experienced that before. That is in our food, but these animals have to stand shoulder to shoulder, breathing their poop and their urine, and eating food that they're not even uh, designed and adapted to eat. Another uh, agroforestry practice here is, oh, multiple species. Sheep, yes, they do, they do graze down too much, they browse too many plants. Well, they're perfectly useful for getting rid of the plants that you don't want, like staghorn sumac, multiflora rose, prickly ash. You put them in the uh, uh, little uh, electro net right there, they can be used as a tool. What we're doing here is we are actually creating a three-dimensional perennial ecosystem and we're using the livestock as the tool to make that system. So we have to farm organically in order to build organic matter in our soil. I'm using animals to manage the system to drive it forward in a more sustainable ecological manner because remember that brush on the side of the road? The species that we've planted, we can cut them down, we can burn them, uh, and they're gonna sprout right back. And so these guys are managing the whole system and adding the fertility along the way. These guys come in, these are my favorite buddies. Notice how the graze is all grassed. Pigs can be incredibly destructive when they're not managed properly as a tool. 
These guys are cleaning up fallen apples that have larvae in it, so now they're pest control. Uh, they're scratching on the bark of flaky bark of trees so there's no pest habitat for the uh, pests to overwinter in. They're picking up, this is after harvest, chestnut harvest, they're cleaning up the chestnuts. Now we have a products, we have products that nobody else has, right? When was the last time you bought prosciutto that was made from hazelnut, apple, and chestnut finished pork? <laughs> go online, go online to lacursia, Q-U-E-R-C-I-A dot com or net or org, whatever. And then look at their acorn edition Tamworth hams and click on buy one. First of all, you can't. There's a waiting list like two years long. One ham, $1,000. We are producing products that are they're extraordinarily valuable, uh, extraordinarily nutritious, and I don't care what the data said in the Stanford University about how much was on it or not. Poison is poison. I'm not want poison on my food. Thank you. Another simple technique, we're adding more, taking more carbon out of the atmosphere and turning it into biomass. This is a simple system designed around our equipment. We're farmers. This isn't backyard gardening anymore. We're on the farm scale. This is planting um, a row of trees between your fields of whatever it is. And once again, you can do it with one six-row corn planter wide. You can do 30 acres wide. This is your choice. You're the farmers. When we have perennial ground cover and when we have tree cover, we're taking even more carbon out of the atmosphere so that eventually, when these systems are mature and we have a partial shade, enough sun so our crops still grow and the trees are still growing, we can, we can accumulate like 25, 30 tons of carbon per acre, starting with a soil that was bare black dirt, no organic matter at all. We can turn this into a massive, massive carbon sink. I don't need credits for that. I don't need to get paid by some stupid trader to, for me to do this because this is the right thing to do. We're cleaning up the air, we're cleaning up the soil, we're making new soil, we're filtering the water out, we're not using toxic chemicals, we're raising animals that are happy that will come up to you and accept pats and scratches and willingly load on the trailer themselves when it's time to go to their next freezer. <laughs> so I think I only have, oh, okay, so let's, let's gr uh, grow, you know, between our row crops, whether it's uh, corn and beans, uh, alfalfa, what if it's salad greens? This guy did it differently. Instead of being a salad green farmer that then planted trees, they were cherry orchardists looking for extra income. All you got to do is stick extra, extra crops in at extra spaces, and, and these people are not small scale. This is not handwork. These are all designed around our equipment. This is one of the largest salad green packing houses in Quebec. They started as a cherry operation, making cherry juice and cherry juice concentrate. When they established a new block of cherries, they said, well, let's try this you know, agroforestry alley cropping thing. And they planted some uh, salad greens down between the rows. They made so much money on the salad greens that now the salad greens are the dominant uh, economic force in their operation. They're the largest salad green, fresh pack, ready to eat salad green operators in Quebec. More productivity per acre, organic, carbon out of the atmosphere, into the soil, cleaning the water, cleaning the air on and on and on. So some of the things that Anna had mentioned, so what we'll end up with is a, is a farm that looks something like this. We got our rows of trees, our crops in between. Is there or is there not a factual difference in the ecology of that place that you see right in the middle of the screen? I don't have any university data to back that up, but I have several different endangered species that find their home on our, on our farm. We have all kinds of wild pollinators, so many wild pollinators that honeybees are irrelevant. We got weasels and loggerhead shrikes and rare milkweed plants simply because we're uh, managing it more like nature. We're still producing food, fuels, medicines, and fibers, and we're earning a, a, a decent livelihood. We we're, we've raised, you know, a nice, happy family. At least most of us are happy. <laughs> and what is this all about anyways? Why are we doing what we're doing? You know, we, we think differently than the people who are in an extractive, destructive uh, technological system. We're organic farmers. You know, we're not afraid of change. We are the change. We're making the change. We, we love one another. We spend time with our kids. We go to Washington, D.C. every once in a while. Um, <laughs> and we stick together. One of Anna's points was like, oh, yeah, what we got to do is we've got to, like, uh, debunk the myth spreaders. It's like, well, that's her job. I'm too busy to like debunk the myth spreaders, but I can support people like Anna in, in stopping the, the myth spreaders. Um, one of the best things that we can do is run a successful farm business. Let's prosper. 
When we prosper by creating a healthier, happier, more loving, socially just planet, when we prosper by doing that, we are the economic model that shows the way. Right? And we can't, but we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. We would not have been able to uh, make it out where we were in the middle of nowhere doing this crazy permaculture farm thing unless we had linked together with other crazies in this little co-op called Organic Valley. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Yeah. Originally, it had started with 60 produce growers. Uh, it wasn't working all that well and had collapsed down to just a handful. Uh, there was a reconfiguration, what should we do? There were some guys that were dairy farmers, let's start making cheese. And we'll have buyers in the wintertime that will buy our cheese and we'll doing the produce in the summertime, year-round marketing presence. Well, obviously the dairy took off. Uh, when I had joined, I was grower number 24. What was I thinking? You know, did I really know, yeah, I'm going to join this little co-op that has $300,000 worth of sales. And in a mere 15 years later, it'll be a billion dollars in sales. Think I planned that? No way. Do you think when I was like, I was the, there were two of us, the very first year that somebody had a trade show booth, Faye's like, oh, it'd be so great if you had a trade show booth. So for like six or eight years, I had a trade show booth there, and it's like, just show up, please, come on, we want somebody to have a trade show booth. And then they have the audacity to send me a bill the next year, you've got to pay now to get in because there's demand for this kind of stuff. <laughs> what were we thinking? How, how did we know? How were we to know that our one little drop was going to make that much of a difference? And so every single one of you guys that are here in this audience today, you are the superheroes. Give yourself a hand, okay? <laughs> Tell your story. Your story is more valuable financially, literally, than any crop that you can ever grow. Of all these people out here, the ones who converted from uh, chemical ag to organic ag, and even those of you who've been organic ever since you got started, our stories are critical for the, for the, for the future uh, of humanity. And one of the things, we went back to that last slide there of, the, of our family there. It's my wife, Jennifer, on the right, my oldest son, Eric, on the left, Daniel on the lower right. We're standing in what was a cornfield 15 years earlier than that. But what we're really doing is we're standing on the backs of giants. And one of the giants in this particular picture, and it's part of our story, it's part of who we are as organic farmers that are saving the planet. Where's my dad? Stand up, dad. Come on, why is he? There, all right, there's my dad. Hey. Right. Dad. My dad, uh, my dad grew up 50 miles south of where Ernfried Pfeiffer first came to the USA up in northeastern Maine. He learned how to make compost when he was like 12 years old. Uh, he worked as a little kid for a doctor. Back then, doctors were botanists. They made compost and stuff like that. My dad joined the Biodynamic Farming and Gardeners Association back when there were like four people in the country doing non-chemical agriculture. The word organic haven't even been invented yet. Um, <laughs> when, all of a sudden, when, when he got started doing organic, if you had said the word organic, they would arrest you for being a socialist. Okay, seriously, not funny at all. If you said that we would go to these meetings when I was little, these little organic gardening meetings, holding daddy's finger, he takes me down to the basement of the library or the fire station, and a sign says, you know, blah, 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 food association. I said, well, dad, I thought we were going to the, <laughs> we've come a long way, haven't we? A long, long way. We are standing on the backs of giants before us, I honor all of our great ancestors that we've had that have brought us to this point today and I honor every single, every one of you. You are the superheroes. We are changing the world. We are cleaning up our environment. We are building a socially just, personally responsible structure, system, business, creative, everything, all of it. We are the change. Go out and make it happen. Thank you.